Hej och välkomna och, och kanske allra mest speciellt välkomna till ni som inte var här igår och in, kommer för första dagen idag. För det finns ett litet gäng som gör det. Jag heter Helena. Jag heter Emil. Och vi kommer att fortsätta leda er genom den här dagen. Den här dagen är lite speciell. Man har... Man får, ha, man får välja förhållningssätt. Antingen har man en fruktansvärd koll på alla tider i programmet och följer det slaviskt. Eller så örlar man runt mellan rummen lite så där som man vill. Det beror på vilken personlighet man har. Men vi ska säga att det är fullt tillåtet att gå runt idag. Vi kommer att hålla till här. Vi kommer att vara nere i stacken. Och man får alltså lov att mitt i ett seminarium resa sig upp och gå, till, gå ner till stacken eller ner i stacken och gå upp hit. Så ni vet. Och man går ju ner till stacken som ligger här nere genom den dörren. Upp och ner och fram och tillbaka. Och, och, ja. Det kommer att vara lite spring helt enkelt. Men ni som har bokat in er på workshopen UGL, ni ska ha koll på era tider. Och för de som nu sitter och tänker, oh, den där workshopen den låter jättespännande. Det finns sju platser kvar till eftermiddag. I eftermiddag äger de rum mellan 13 och 15 och 15 och 15. Jag ska strax berätta vad det är för någonting. Eh, och vill man anmäla sig, då går man ut till Veronica i, på, vid anmälningsbordet där ute. UGL som nu eh, drar igång... Klockan 9 till elva, förmiddagspasset, och det är alltså fullt. I den här workshopen så kommer vi tillsammans att titta på hur våra olika beteenden och drivkrafter påverkar vårt samarbete. Och hur vi kan handleda oss själva och coacha varandra för att nå en maximal samverkan. Workshopen leds av Eva Sellek och Louise Norman. Är ni här inne? Eller är ni, nej, de är säkert där inne i Harlem. Och Harlem är ju precis här ut till vänster. Ut så. Eh, Eva Sellek är från The Collaboration Lab. Som hon är utbildad ULG-handledare och arbetar som organisationskonsult med ledarskapsutbildning. Och Louise Norman är också då UGL-handledare. Och till vardags arbetar hon på Hyper Island som learning designer och facilitator. Jag tror det här blir väldigt intressanta timmar faktiskt. Så det händer då in i Harlem 9 till 11 och 13 till 15. Emil, mm. du kommer att ha hand om den här scenen idag, stora delar av den i alla fall. Just det. Vi börjar ju gemensamt lite grann, förutom de som ska in i Harlem strax. Och sen så kommer vi avsluta gemensamt. Men däremellan, vad händer här? Här kommer det att fortsätta ett program med intressanta föreläsningar och intressanta diskussioner, förutsätter jag. Vi ska bland annat få träffa gårdagens heders... Oh, nu tappar jag medaljer. Förtjänstmedaljer. Förtjänstmedaljörer som ska vara med i ett samtal med Hemlingsförbundets ordförande i, om deras sitt arbete i Harads. Ja, och mm. mycket kommer att vara så likt... Från igår. Det finns orangea jackor och frågor om man nu inte kommer ihåg all information som Helena drog. Eh, utbildningsradion var med oss igår. De har lämnat oss idag. Inte för att de tyckte det var tråkigt utan för att det var planerat så. Eh, men vi fortsätter och, och vi livesänder. filmar ju. Vi livesänder ju det här idag också. Så sitter man här och känner att oh, det här är så spännande. Det här vill jag att någon vän ska titta på också. Så livesänder vi på ra.se. play. Ja. Mm. Och vad händer då där nere, undrar du? Ja, vad händer där nere? Ja, vad händer där nere? I stacken då, en trappa ner, där har vi ett lite nytt grepp. Vi får inte kalla det för TED Talks, så det gör vi inte. Vi kallar det för kulturarvsmonologerna. Lite kortare, lite mer intensiva tal. Med experter som kommer att förmedla sin specialistkunskap. Jag ser Magnus Källström bland annat, vår runolog, vet jag inte, jag får kalla dig det va? Men du har så många andra titlar ja. som kommer att prata efter lunch bland annat. De kommer, alla de här som kommer att prata ner i stacken kommer att dela med sig av sin nyfikenhet och sin glöd och sitt engagemang och sin vetgirighet. Eh, och det kommer att röra sig allt mellan resliga byggnader och underjordiska valv till 
från ben som berör och skrifter som förför. Och den allra första talaren som börjar klockan tio där nere är Fredrik Sjöberg. Fredrik, finns du här i lokalen just nu? Ja, han kommer nu, eller så viftar han någonstans, men jag ser inte honom. Fredrik Sjöberg, eh, han vann precis litteraturpriset i Ig Nobel. Och vet ni inte vad Ig Nobel är, så, så googla det. Det är alltså ett pris som har instiftats som man först skrattar åt och sen tänker man efter. Eh, och han vann det här för sitt självbiografiska verk i tre volymer om njutningen av att samla flugor som är döda och flugor som ändå inte är döda. Eh, mm. Det ska han dock inte prata så mycket om här. Han ska prata med oss om nyfikenheten som drivkraft och om varför man håller på. Och det börjar alltså klockan tio där nere. Eh, alla ni som ska vara med på UGL-workshopen som börjar klockan nio och ni som ännu inte har tagit er in i Harlem. Jag ber er ställa er upp och gå ut genom den dörren där och in i Harlem så ska vi fortsätta här. Ha så trevligt! Mm. Ja. Är det något som är? Ja, ja. Nu så. Alldeles strax. Så där. Och då har vi alltså en gemensam inledning som du ska få prata om. Och sen så eh, drar vi igång klockan tio där nere och mm. kvart över tio här efter det. Varsågod Emil. Nu följer jag nästa programpunkt och då ska vi ta the English switch. So now we're all uh, fluent in English. And we are going to listen to uh, a man coming all the way from Great Britain, originally from Canada, uh, Angus Kennedy. And he is the author of Being Cultured in Defense of Discrimination. And Mr. Kennedy also runs the Institute of Ideas annual summer school, the Academy. It has been described as something of an intellectual summer holiday away from it all. Not a winter holiday, a summer holiday. And that makes me and the rest of the audience very curious. And I understand, Angus, that you are exploring the borderlands between culture and cultural heritage, amongst many other things. Yeah. The stage is yours. Hope so. you, you, you can explain. Thank, thank you yourself. very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, I wrote a book a couple of summers ago called uh, In being cultured in defense of discrimination, <clears throat> so, which was deliberately provocative in its uh, subtitle, at least. And I might be a little bit provocative here today because I think these are issues that we have to consider uh, very seriously uh, today. So hopefully I can say some, some things that will get you thinking. But um, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, it's a genuine honor to be here today, uh, even if being here at all is something of a surprise to me uh, on at least two levels. Uh, firstly, because I know little enough about uh, Swedish culture or heritage, um, though maybe I'm aware of it in sort of outline at least as part of a, a shared European inheritance. I know something about Vikings, um, Strindberg, uh, Moberg's The Emigrants, uh, Henning Mankel, of course, uh, in the arts, Johann Tobias Zergel and Anders Zorn, and from my childhood and from my daughters, uh, Astrid Lindgren and Tove Janssen. But I haven't got any knowledge in detail because I wasn't lucky enough to have been born into uh, Swedish culture, uh, nor grew up in it. But I'm naively optimistic about these sorts of things. Uh, I hope I can still make good, uh, and the embarrassment of my lack of culture in the face of this invitation has had at least the positive impact of making me start reading Soderbergh's Martin Burke's Youth uh, on the Plain. Uh, secondly, it was a pleasant surprise to be invited here because there's a chance that I'm here as a representative of what Tiffany called yesterday the bad old days, or uh, the good old days, depending on your point of view. Um, not so much because I believe, and it would be silly to believe this, uh, that there's any chance of any return uh, to those good old days, but at least in the sense that I'm a defender of the superiority of Western culture, uh, the Western canon of enlightenment, universalism, and of cultural discrimination. 
By that I mean, I believe that some cultures and some cultural products are more equal than others. Some works are transcendent and some are trash. And, and this is the link to society, I believe that it's the act of cultural discrimination that allows us to understand culture more broadly, the good, the bad, and the indifferent, in a very similar way into which the relationship of discrimination, in a more general sense, underpins the very possibility of society as such. And by that I mean that the foundation and the very possibility of association, of being together, of society, and of being in society, uh, relies on discrimination of some sort. Society is made up, or it should be made up, of voluntary associations uh, built from the ground up. And these are communities, communities of interest, of shared and shareable interest, no doubt, but not communities of interest to all. Were they to self-define so broadly as to be of interest to all, uh, then why membership would need very much uh, nothing at all. And what would democracy be, after all, if we all agreed? We wouldn't need it for a start. But what is this culture uh, thing anyway? We always have great problems with definition, I think, talking about uh, culture and heritage. Maybe if I just set out some of my views on the importance of the preservation of uh, heritage and culture first. Uh, I think of culture as being um, the way of life in its broader sense, the way of life of a given community, uh, a way of life that's been established over time, uh, and of our heritage as being markers of that culture. Uh, the art, the literature, the buildings, the landscapes we have created. There is a tradition in any given culture, and also, in a sense, more broadly, of the Western tradition. And here I would see that tradition, would define that as being, in a way, what's still standing when the critics have stopped arguing. That tradition is the residue of critical conflicts, of long arguments over value and quality. And the longer those conflicts have been settled, so much greater the confidence we can have in the value of the works concerned. There are two senses, then, of the word culture that I think we have to be uh, alert to and keep in, in play at the same time and in tension. Culture is both a, both a verb and a noun. It's subjective and objective. At its very beginning, uh, in ancient Rome, the word culture, from the verb colere, carried a twofold sense within it, an active one of caring for the world, improving the world we find for our benefit, and a passive one, a more objective sense of being in that world uh, and enjoying being in that world that we have cultivated for ourselves. As a verb, then, culture is a process of individual betterment and moral refinement through the making of judgments and discriminating between what one thinks one ought to like and what one ought not to like. This is not a simple matter of getting it right in some way. It's not like mathematics. The development of taste relies on the exercise uh, and, and a frequent exercise of the faculties of judgment, discernment, and reason. But as a noun, culture is equally a tradition whose rules operate at a social level and which we as social beings inherit. It's a historical uh, thing, something we are born into, the result of a long process of judgment. And culture in this sense also, however, relies on freedom, degrees of both socio-political freedom, including an openness to building on and altering the tradition we receive, recognizing it as the expression of conflicting judgments may be, but not necessarily settled from all time. That cultural world that we hold in common, our cultural inheritance, uh, I think that world is also something that enables and underpins our individual journeys to become free. We don't set out from nowhere to become someone. Uh, we become ourselves through our institutions of law, education, politics, religion, and so on. We are, acquire our freedom through them. We become cultured through our culture. And in so doing, we become accountable to each other as members of a world held in common. Well, if it's like that, what's the problem? I mean, that's the way, to my mind, it's supposed to work. Um, the problem, of course, is that since the Enlightenment, since the uh, <clears throat> end of the 18th century, uh, at least, we've become increasingly unsettled in our understanding of ourselves uh, and our inheritance. Not just in the sense that Tiffany talked about yesterday of the some often sort of childish equation of Western culture with colonialism, 
uh, and imperialism as if Beethoven had been behind the Gatling and Maxim machine guns. But even in the 19th century, when Matthew Arnold uh, wrote his Great Culture and Anarchy, it was written in response to a fear of something, anarchy. Uh, it was written in response to, to a feeling that Western culture was somehow not enough on its own and needed to be helped down with a degree of medicine uh, by the state through the establishment of national museums and so on. Otherwise, the people might become uh, revolting. So why is, this, why is there this feeling from the end of the Enlightenment onwards that we don't find ourselves at home in our own culture? What is it that disturbs us about ourselves, if you like, uh, and means that it's difficult uh, for us to find ourselves as belonging in our own culture and our own society? Tiffany uh, had a nice phrase for this yesterday, I think, um, that objects that were once objects of enlightenment are now objects of apology for enlightenment. And she also spoke about our fear of making judgments how leaders of cultural institutions can become very reticent about making cultural judgments uh, in public. And partly I think this is fear, and uh, partly I think it's an understandable fear. It's a fear about the future. Uh, since the Enlightenment, we've become much more self-conscious of our ability to shape the future. And we've also learned through experience that those attempts to shape the future can have, let's call it, unpredictable results. Uh, that we can act in the world, we're free to do so, but we're never quite sure uh, if it's going to turn out uh, for the best. And that fear can leave, that leave us you know, hungry for change, uh, but equally intolerant of people who would change things uh, at the same time. And it can lead us to, into a self-apologetics uh, um, in which the rewriting of certain sections of history becomes attractive. Uh, the trope is that history has been written by the oppressors, written by the victors, it would always be strange if it was written by the losers, don't you think? Uh, uh, but that we must somehow must apologize for those bad old days, rewrite history, bring it up to date, include those who've been historically underrepresented, and make, make more room uh, for others, if you like. Let me give you an example um, from back home. In London, there are blue plaques on buildings, uh, blue circles mounted on the walls, uh, with white inscriptions on them. You're likely to have seen them uh, when you've, if you've been in London, or you can certainly look them up online. Uh, the plaques are there to indicate that a famous person once lived in a given building. They say, for example, Joseph Conrad, 1857 to 1924, novelist, lived here. Here, in this case, being 17 Gillingham Street, Westminster, SW1. Now, the plaques were instituted by the then Society of Arts in 1866, uh, but have been administered by English Heritage since 1986. As such, the scheme is one of the longest-running examples, um, I would imagine, in the heritage profession. You're probably going to tell me differently in a moment. Um, but I think, you know, from that moment in the 19th century is when uh, heritage as a concern uh, with the plaques, with the National Trust, certainly came into being in the United Kingdom. Uh, the first plaque was to Lord Byron in Cavendish Square. Sadly, that building's not there anymore. Um, but there are plaques to Winston Churchill, Oscar Wilde, Benjamin Franklin, Enid Blyton, Graham Greene, John Ruskin, William Wilberforce, Captain Cook, Edith Cavell, Mahatma Gandhi, to artists, scientists, politicians, uh, writers, sportsmen, and musicians. Nearly a thousand of these plaques in London. The institution has a number of rules for um, plaquing. Uh, as it were, rules which are a good example of, I think, of historical preservation efforts. Uh, the person in question must have been dead for uh, at least 20 years, which gives um, uh, time for things to settle down, almost long enough for the person not to become the subject of an historical sex abuse inquiry, uh, but sadly not quite long enough these days. Uh, the person must have lived in London for a significant or during an important period of their life. And the building itself must survive and not have a significantly altered exterior. The person must be recognized as eminent within their own professional calling, and their achievements must have had an exceptional impact in terms of public recognition or be deserving of national recognition. The public can nominate uh, people for plaques. There's a bit of democracy in there, uh, a shared common national culture, uh, and there's a committee that adjudicates over the blue plaques. I think the scheme's a worthy uh, and admirable one, uh, one that's never done any harm uh, in its long history, and arguably a deal of good, marking out the distinction of both 
notable people and the buildings in the cities in which they made a home and spent it out a part, at least, of a memorable and eminent life. This shows the importance of history for a people in a place with a continued and valued way of life. It picks out the people who mattered and who made a difference and contributed to building a society. But, <clears throat> inevitably there's a but, um, but because today we are nothing if not suspicious of our history, uh, English heritage has taken it upon itself uh, to embark on a new diversity initiative for the plaques, which it turns out stand accused of overlooking the contributions uh, to British history of black and Asian figures. English Heritage's website states that less than 4% of the more than 900 blue plaques are dedicated to black and Asian historical figures. They explain this as partly being due to lack of public nominations meeting the criteria, maybe it's our fault, and partly by the lack of records linking the person in the building uh, in which they live, which is to say that English Heritage looks now at these blue plaques as a record of English history and finds that the record of English history is just well too English and that something must be done about it. And in this case, the absence of historical records linking the people and the building in which they lived is no barrier to their drive for diversity. In fact, the absence of any historical record becomes, of course, the evidence of its existence. It's not there because it must have been written out by official history. So enter Augustus Caesarly Hayford, who works for English Heritage now, in search of diversity, saying, this great city has always been an ethnic melting pot. Melting, melting pot. We are linked through language, culture, political alliance, and economic partnership to every part of the world. And peoples from places that we have touched have found their way here to not just make London their home, but to make London and this country what it is. Now, the only problem with this statement is that it's not true. The opposite, that London has made the world more like London, than is, is more close to the truth than it being the other way around. Now, nevertheless, it's a deeply held prejudice uh, that London is the creation of the world somehow, uh, a world city rather than a, a British one. And I think that view says a lot about the, how, how the heritage industry has changed its perspectives over the last 30 years or so. Since English Heritage took over the program, they've embarked on a self-conscious uh, modernization program, words to strike fear into any cultural historian's heart, uh, bringing the plaques up to date with what they perceive to be an evolving sense of who should be honored. Now, my concern here uh, is that the this leads to a desire to rewrite history uh, in the light of contemporary prejudices. Uh, to rewrite history as being more diverse than it was. Uh, it's a concern which is understandable. Uh, it's driven by concerns about lack of social cohesion today and the impact on British society of mass migration in the last 30 years. English heritage wants people to feel that they're part of English history in some way, wants them to feel that they belong. But in my view, that these attempts to try and get people to problematize the concept of heritage in contemporary society are dangerous in at least three important ways. Firstly, the rewriting of history in the light of contemporary concerns is anti-historical and runs the risk of denying history as such because it recognizes no greater authority than that of contemporary relevance. If we go down the route of thinking um, that we always need to be reworking history, reworking our cultural environments to make sure they're relevant to contemporary society, then in a way we're saying that nothing is set to last. Uh, everything is transient, everything can be rewritten and reassessed in the light of the present. Um, and it, it produces a very one-dimensional view of the historical process. Secondly, this kind of instrumental use of society to, mute, to use it to meet the needs of, con of the contemporary is pretty transparent uh, and pretty clumsy. And I think it can actually turn people off. Uh, it can make them cynical about their cultural heritage if they feel that it's being used to make them think in a particular way. I think people know that they're being pandered to when they're told uh, that history was all about servants. It was all about little people. It was all about them after all. When history becomes all downstairs with no upstairs, uh, the danger that there is very little depth 
uh, in it left. People know culture is being used to tell them how to think, to get them to, to agree that a certain way of organizing society is a good way, when in fact history tells us there have been many ways. And when you tell people how to think and condemn them as deplorables uh, if they fall into a basket of people who don't agree with how you think, then you may get results that you didn't expect. And thirdly, I think this is the danger because it can deepen the sense of alienation, the sense of not belonging in society that it sets out to try and address. Because rejecting the culture we have inherited cannot be, I think, the basis for any new sense of being together at all, of having very much in common apart from that act of rejection. There can't be community built on rejection or based on repudiation. Much as there is no coming together in Europe when national boundaries are torn down without popular consent, so no matter how thorough the assaults are on the old cultural inheritance, the bad old days, they will never lead to new forms of membership, nor to new forms of belonging, only to a kind of uh, alienation, a kind of profound and deep existential aloneness. And movements based on uh, such repudiation who say that our culture is not shared, let's say Black Lives Matter, uh, that movement, they will themselves inevitably fragment, uh, since we cannot base being together on a rejection of our shared humanity or on an essentialization of difference. And I think it's this fact alone, if nothing else, that demands that everyone involved in the arts, involved in the business of culture and of heritage, demands of us that we be cultural conservatives. And the alternative is nihilism. The alternative is a form of rejection and desecration of the very spirit of history uh, is disturbing, if not far more reaching, than the physical destruction of Nineveh by Islamic State bulldozers. I want to start, up with a st start to finish up with maybe a more positive question to, to explore. Uh, what is it that's unique about our culture and what uh, is good about it? And I think that one of the things we have to consider is that we're all members of particular cultural communities, of course, but the ones that we happen to be part of here uh, in Western Europe, in North America, and so on, by and large, are ones that have a special and, I think, unique tradition of universalism. Enlightenment universalism is Europe's unique contribution to human civilization, uh, and I think much needed defense. Here, here's why. It's thanks to Enlightenment universalism that we operate a broadly Kantian broadly Christian morality based on the idea of what's good for my neighbor is good for me. It's thanks to the Enlightenment that ideas of racial and sexual equality, of democracy and the rule of law have become an, an embedded part of Western social and political culture. And it's because of the Enlightenment that so much is demanded of Western art, literature, culture and heritage in a way that is not demanded of Chinese literature, for example. We don't demand that Chinese literature speak to us all in the same way that we do of Shakespeare. Chinese literature, at least in its classical form, and this is true of Islamic culture as well, maybe more so, has simply been content always with being Chinese literature. Being itself was good enough for itself. It was never plagued with doubt that there might be other forms of literature out there in the world better than it, that it had to in some way compete with. It never suffered from what Bloom called the anxiety of influence. Western literature, however, from the beginning has been conscious of what we might call the problem of origins, the question, questions of its quality and legitimacy, right back to Virgil's, Virgil's self-conscious reworking of Homer into a Greek authority underpinning the cultural authority of his Virgil's Roman masterpiece. Western tradition has always rested on uh, foundations that were not its own. Uh, the twin pillars, as Remy Bragg has argued, the twin pillars of Athens and Jerusalem, it's always been self-conscious of its own, and this is his term, secondarity. It's coming after, coming later, coming late on the scene, not being self-sufficient, uh, not being enough for itself, always lacking something and never being full of itself. And as a result, I think Western culture has always been a self-conscious exploration of other cultures, other places and other times. Western culture and its writers, musicians, scientists, historians, archaeologists and anthropologists have never felt satisfied, never rested on their laurels. It's not far-fetched to know, say we wouldn't know what we do about Chinese classical literature if it hadn't been for 19th century interest in it, or much about the statues and bronzes that Tiffany was speaking about yesterday. 
Western culture has always been rapacious, if you like, always been guilty of cultural plundering, but in a, in a good way. It's reached out into the world and looked at what it has found, tried to understand it, argued with it, taken the best of it, and left the rest behind. Uh, it's the same self-conscious understanding at work when we look out at the world and make judgments such as to say that it would be progress if, for example, Saudi Arabia were to become a secular constitutional democracy, gave women their freedom and turned from the whip and the sword to tolerance, or if China fully adopted the free market, the rule of law, and liberal democracy, if they became, in other words, a bit more like us, just that little bit less diverse. And at the level of national culture, uh, to complement the, le the level of Enlightenment universalism, at the level of national culture, the nation is itself uh, an Enlightenment project. It's the historical product, a form of settlement, that provides the backdrop and underpinning to our individuality and to us as society. Remember, it was with the emergence of the nation, the self-defining political community, that came into existence with the end of absolute monarchy, it was precisely here that national culture came into being as the expression of the whole way of life of a people. It was at this point that French cuisine became something of interest, uh, a matter of self-conscious interest for the French, a matter of national pride uh, in the 19th century, and then an export for us all. It was at this point that culture stopped being the culture of the court uh, and of the court flatterer, when it became the shared interest of a people and could start to develop as we started to love what was ours conscious of what was ours, and of the fact that it was ours to grow, care for, and develop. And we did that. It's at the level of the nation, too, that democracy uh, has any meaning within national borders. Only nations can treat and trade with each other. Only on the basis of nations is internationalism possible, uh, or even conceivable. The nation is just the historical identity and the continuing allegiance that unites us in a body politic. It's the first per person, plural, as people have argued, of settlement. It's a we. It does not need to be opened up uh, to something foreign to help its own process of development in an attempt to make it somehow more relevant uh, or more accessible. And why not? Because the development of national culture is driven by, and you know, I will be precise here, it's driven by self-interest, uh, driven by an interest in itself as something worthy of interest. It is not driven by the interests of others. And if it were driven by the interests of others, it would cease to be uh, free. Maybe that's a bleak. I mean, I mean, there's something good enough in French haute cuisine already without needing the spice of diversity to somehow liven it up. Another way of putting this is that diversity is maybe not the most obvious place to look when one wants to build solidarity in society. A nation can conserve its heritage if it so chooses, if it feels it is in its own self-interest. If we take the, uh, the issue of the environment, the problems of environmental change can only be addressed at the level of the nation. Put simply, if we don't want to do something about uh, problems of environmental change in our own countries, uh, we won't. If we do care about it, we will. No amount of pious international treaties are going to force us or the Chinese to do anything against their own interests. So to start to conclude, or to conclude, um, in fact, let's talk about Swedish culture, um, Swedish national culture. As I intimated at the beginning, I'm, I'm certainly no expert. That's a, that's a given. I'm not Swedish, nor have I, as a foreigner, devoted a whole life to becoming Swedish. That's a possible project, of course, uh, not just one that I've embarked upon. Uh, you can't rely on me to look after Visby uh, or rock carvings in Tarnum any more than I can rely on you, uh, or Tiffany, it would appear, to look after Stonehenge or Blenheim Palace or the new town of Edinburgh. I have to rely on healthy national self-interest, gentle patriotism, and a love of home to engender that spirit of conservation. But this, at the same time, when those things are preserved, uh, they're preserved for everyone, because they're markers of our efforts to culture uh, the world we inherit. And when that project becomes a self-conscious project, uh, it becomes something in which we can all take an interest and ask if it's a good project or not. Is that the right thing to preserve, and how? And when we agree, and sometimes we don't, but when we agree, uh, we move towards confirming or creating a shared tradition uh, in which we can all take pride 
and find ourselves at home. Which is why, at the end of the day, and, and to really finish, we should pursue the business of cultural her heritage as a duty, uh, an act of love given freely to things that deserve it, uh, and, that deserve, and things that deserve that love because they are those things that make us feel at home in the world. And through the affirmation and value given to home, make it possible to consider opening the door to guests, uh, and sometimes to people whom we can decide to bring into the family, uh, as it were. Thank you very much. Now, I think we're just going to have questions. Thank you very much, Angus. You're welcome. <clears throat> uh, I have a few questions to start with. As a, as a starter, you can think over how you reacted to what you've just heard. I think it's several uh, interesting perspectives. I just wanted to start with a, um, maybe you won't like this, but I mean, <laughs> a personal question, because you are uh, Canadian born and living in. Great Britain. What is your, your personal journey coming to these conclusions as yourself as like moving from one country to another, even though it's within the, the same hemisphere? Um, <clears throat> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure the movement's from one country to another. And I did sort of crisscross the Atlantic a lot as a child because my father was an, uh, an academic. Uh, he now He's Canadian too, now lives in the States, and I think he's in, he's in tears at the moment um, um, about his choice of adopted country. Um, but, you know, he's a professor of English. Um, the, our bias was always towards the United Kingdom, uh, I think, um, Scotland in particular. The, that shaped a lot of my uh, cultural background as I was growing up. Um, I, the only way in which I think, at a personal level, um, my growing up, my experience of growing up might have shaped my views, is maybe it leads me to put a bit more importance on the value of being at home than I might do otherwise, <clears throat> simply because I've had something of an outsider's perspective, um, moving from Canada to Edinburgh to Canada to London to Canada to you know, Scotland to London. Um, I've never felt quite at home, but I, maybe that's may, why I think that it's important that we should. <coughs> just just to, to amplify that, I think it's the question of perspective that, that I value in this. If we, when we try and discriminate between what's good and what's bad and what's beautiful and what's ugly and what's true and what's false, the more disinterested one's perspective uh, can be, the more res removed from uh, local attachment, so much the better. Um, Kant talked about having a perspective that tried to have a take in everybody's perspective. You know, so the ultimately rational perspective would have everybody's point of view carefully considered and weighed up within it before coming to a decision. Uh, we don't always have time to do that as much as possible, but we do tr strive towards that objectivity, try and be impartial and fair and disinterested. So taking a perspective that is outside <laughs> local attachment um, in a way can show the importance of, can lead one to understand what's good and what's not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, another thought I uh, had listening to you is the, a question regarding exp the exploration of, of history, because you may argue that sometimes you have to rewrite history or g give new perspectives on history, because the, the history written is yeah. a child of, of its time and the, the interests going on. I have yeah. uh, an example from Sweden uh, in 1931. We had in, in Ådalen, up north, uh, protesting workers on, on strike, and uh, the military opened fire, and there were several shot dead. And then you had a certain history for like 60 or 70 years about what really happened that actually w was a result of the alliance between the, the state and the, and the company. You, have to, you, you didn't want that fight. So it's just like 15 years ago that you yeah. really could talk about what, what happened and who acted how. And that, I mean, so, something about that. How are we to like, re, 
explore history yes. and not falsify it, but... I think that's a really difficult question. Um, and I was thinking something similar myself as I got to that part of what I was saying, because obviously on some levels, um, we never want the business of writing history to stop. Um, you know, what would the historians do uh, if, they, if they were out of a job? It's never cut and dried forever. On the other hand, if, it to be, if it's to be history, uh, it must be, in some sense, uh, true to history. Right? It can't just be rewritten from the perspective of the, 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 uh, the, the moment. Now, in your example, I mean, I think that's a good example, and we can all think of uh, similar ones, I'm sure. Um, how do I react to that? I think, one, um, it's always too soon to be writing history, I suppose, and contemporary history like that from 50 years ago, um, I think the record is still very much out on. I was joking about 20 years uh, being too short today for getting a blue plaque. I mean, 200 years might be a safer basis, but even then, I know people are busy rewriting the history of uh, imperialism, uh, Victorian, German, uh, French imperialism at the moment, um, driven, no doubt, in some sense, by contemporary concerns. Mm -hmm. But insofar as they maintain the greatest degree of their sort of objective historical rigor I was just mm -hmm. talking about, uh, and are true to their subject matter, and try and rid themselves of their contemporary prejudices, rather than self-consciously going along with them, mm -hmm. right, then I think that process of rewriting history uh, is, a, is inevitable. Um, uh, that's just doing history. It's not rewriting it to fit an agenda. Mm -hmm. People, I think, always have to be very conscious of and self-critical as they embark on a, those sorts of uh, endeavors, because it can easily become a sort of a crusade, can't it? You know, let's right the wrongs of history. I don't think of history as necessarily having rights and wrongs. It's it's moved moved past uh, that sort of court uh, jury system. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the the example uh, connecting Beethoven to the the machine gun, <laughs> or separating them <laughs> rather. Yeah. Is is that possible to do? Is is there is, is it a coincidence that, I mean, the, the Great Britain and France and all of these cultural superpowers also, at some stage, has been military superpowers? <laughs> is it possible to separate the, the <laughs> cultural heritage from force? <laughs> or are they intertwined? Um, I did make a quip about history being written by the victors, um, and indeed it is. Um, I also like to sometimes think that uh, the losers lost because they were losers. Right? They, they aren't part of the historical record because I don't mean this in any sort of Darwinian, you know, red and tooth and claw sense necessarily. I mean in the sense that some ways of living, some human ways of living are, are better than others. And some ideas uh, are better than others. The rule of law uh, is better than trial by combat. Right? Hopefully we can agree on that one, and if not, you know, we can fight about it. Um, <laughs> or I can run away, but, you know, I'd like to have recourse to the, to the law uh, and democracy and to elected politicians, and I think those are ways of life that have justifiably outlasted, uh, and I hope they will continue to outlast a number of their alternatives. Uh, in that sense, if, if, that, if, you know, people writing history are people from that tradition, then good. Um, and has that historically been underpinned by force uh, and tragedy and massacre? No doubt, it has. Um, we shouldn't flinch away from that or pretend it was otherwise. Hegel, I think, said that history is written on a slaughter bench. Um, but, you know, it's got us here, right? It's not, uh, some things are getting better. I know it doesn't feel like it um, at the minute when we look out. Uh, across the world, um, and people are bemoaning um, women's betrayal in the election in America. Uh, but women in Western society have really never had it so good. 
compared to being in the 19th century or the 18th. Our standard of life is higher, we live longer, you know. These things have been won through bloody struggle, yes, but won, won and need to be defended. Thank you. I, let's send the word out in the hall. <laughs> if we have any questions from the audience, we have one down here, the questioning corner. Well, thank you. And please stand up as you, it's brilliant. I'm already standing. <laughs> Mats Lidderspore is my name, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm at the um, uh, country administration board in Skåne, Skania, in the southernmost part of Sweden, uh, where I'm head of that work. Uh, you said something that I f feel is quite understandable, that having a home or having the feeling of a home is a kind of necessity for the possibility to open yourself for guests. Uh, and then I came to think that it might also be a necessity for the possibility of being a guest yourself. In the sense that to be a guest you must yourself have a home. You must understand the, the uh, nature of guesting and being guested, yes. Um, I think that's true, isn't it? Um, and that's why we recognize the <clears throat> tragic condition of being a refugee, right? uh, of being homeless. Uh, that's why we give special status to refugees, uh, uh, maybe more than we would to, e to economic migrants. Um, and the this condition of being a refugee, <coughs> which is in some ways, I think it's of such concern, I'm going to go out on a limb here, I think it's of such concern to us in the contemporary world because we're all moving into the condition of being refugees. Right? We really focus on the, the plight of the real refugees because we all feel a bit of that sense of being out of place, being unsettled, not feeling at home in the world. And their, their tragedy particularly strikes us because of that. Um, and it's also tragedy because you know, what a refugee wants to do as a refugee is to get home. You know, they've had to flee for whatever reason um, and need help and assistance to, to get back where it's possible. Um, in a lot of the Middle East, we see home being destroyed uh, in ways that it's going to take a long time um, to rebuild, though I believe it's possible. But yes, I, I think, I mean, it does, maybe I should have said more on this. I, I think there is something that we're all a bit moving into that sense of being a refugee. Um, <clears throat> sorry. My name is Karin Oltenberg, and I've got a comment and a question. And the comment is um, the equivalent of um, er, um, Emil's example of Ordal and would be the Hillsbury Inquiry that is ongoing in the UK at the moment. Um, and if history is an inquiry, it's not rewriting, is it? Maybe that is a question, actually, but I've got a proper question as well. <laughs> so, as a, as a person who's made a home in Scotland, at least for part of your life, what did you think of the Scottish independence movement, <laughs> and, um, which was very much heritage and culture-driven, wasn't it? Um, can I go in reverse order? Because um, I think the, the second one's actually an easier question. Um, I, 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 I think that... Um, it looks like uh, a nationalism uh, and a culture, a defensive national culture, but it's, um, it's, it's anything but. I think it's a rejection of a shared national culture. Um, Scotland has consciously and voluntarily been part of the United Kingdom for uh, many hundreds of years and was very closely linked uh, before that uh, and has been formed into... Um, something much greater than the sum of its parts. I, I think the rejection of that by sections of, sort of self-serving sections of the Scottish political class, because I don't really think they speak to the interests of a lot of ordinary Scots who've got a lot more in common with their neighbours over the border and won't be happy if, if any sort of trade border goes up between the two. Scots would be the losers uh, very clearly in that situation. Um, I don't think the Scottish National Party speaks to the interests of 
uh, our shared national culture. Um, and I don't think they have very much interesting to say about culture. I mean, I don't want to just mock bagpipes and, uh, and haggis, but there is, there is more to, and Robbie Burns has some great poetry, but, but still. Um, on the, the first question um, about his historical inquiries, the Hills, Hillsborough one in Britain, has, uh, which was the football stadium death, has just finished. Um, and immediately there are calls for a new one into the um, police and miners fighting at the Orgreave uh, coking pipe plant during the miners' strike. Um, as soon as one finishes, uh, another one starts. There's a continual uh, litany of apology for the past and a self-conscious demand to right the wrongs of the past. That's why they take the form of inquiries um, with officials and sort of judges and increasingly with therapists, you know? This is more than often or not. It's about, let me help, help you come to terms with the fact that you, you were a striking minor and you lost. Right. And that's to diminish people. Right? That's to make them, you know, subject to this sort of form of therapeutic history, you know? Let's make it okay for you. The same state, the same state that those miners fought, you know, on the picket lines, ironically, um, shows a lot about how things uh, have changed in terms of people's relationship uh, to the state, that it can, it can reach out in a sort of therapeutic form as a redresser of historical wrongs. I find it's, uh, it may just be me, I, I, I would prefer Stalinism, you know? Without the velvet glove of therapy, uh, it was straightforward whitewashing of history. Let's get Trotsky out of the picture. All right, let's move on. Let's shoot some people. Let's move on. <laughs> it was, you know, that was almost preferable. I'm joking. I don't prefer Stalinism. I don't prefer Stalinism to anything. I'm conscious I'm speaking in a foreign language here. Stalin, bad. But, you know. Time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you very Angus. much. <laughs> like, thank you. <laughs> and here's a, a little something from Visby, World Heritage it's from City. Visby. Oh, brilliant. Oh, good. I'm glad Portland. you're looking after Visby. Thank yeah, you very yeah, much. Thank you very much. We slow på svensk knappen igen här. Vi kör en paus på den här scenen till kvart över, men För er som är sugna på kulturarvsmonologerna, en trappa ner i stacken, pratar jag rätt språk, ja. Så börjar den redan klockan tio, så ni har tio minuter på er att hitta dit. Tack så mycket.